We are the ship, the story of Negro League Baseball, words and paintings by Kadir Nelson. We are the ship, all else the sea. Rube Foster, founder of the Negro National League, owner of the Chicago American Giants. First inning, beginnings. I ain't ever had a job. I just always played baseball. Satchel Page. Seems like we've been playing baseball for a mighty long time. At least as long as we've been free. Baseball's the best game there ever was. It's a beautifully designed game that requires a quick wit, a strong body, and a cool head. They say baseball was invented by a fella named Abner Doubleday in Cooperstown, New York, back in the mid-1800s. But that is just another tall tale because no one really knows for sure. But one thing is for sure, soon after that, you could find a baseball game being played just about everywhere in this grand old country of ours, particularly in the big cities like New York and Chicago. People of all types love to play and watch the game. Irish, Italian, German, Cuban, Puerto Rican, and African American. But back then we were called Negro or colored. Every neighborhood and every town had a team, and they would all play one another. Before long, there were professional teams and organized leagues. In the mid-1860s, most professional baseball teams had only white ball players. There were a number of Negroes who did play, though they weren't treated any better than most Negroes in the country at the time. Truth is, those poor fellas were treated downright disgracefully. They were called just about every horrible name in the book, and then some. Several teams wouldn't play another team if it had a Negro on the roster, and in some states, Negroes weren't allowed to play at all. When we did play, we got the wrong directions from our manager and were targets for opposing pitchers and base runners, which was a dangerous thing, because back in those days, no one wore any type of protective gear, not even the catcher. Well... That was until Bud Fowler, the first Negro to play professional baseball, came along. Too many times he was forced to leave the field on crutches after being spiked by a base runner. Now, this was a terrible thing, but some good came out of it. His scarred shins gave him the idea to attach wooden staves from a barrel to his legs for protection. They were the first shin guards and the first protective gear in baseball. They just about saved his legs and his baseball career, or what was left of it anyway. And don't you know that those white fellas tried like the Dickens to break his shin guards? It just gave them a little more ambition to slide feet first when a Negro was covering the base. Despite the cruel treatment Negroes received, there were a few who became quite good ball players like brothers Well Day and Moses Fleetwood Walker, Charlie Grant, Pete Hill, Saul White, Grant Home Run Johnson, Ben Taylor, and Frank Grant. These fellas were great ball players by any measure, but none of that mattered, because they were still Negroes, and most white ball players didn't want to play alongside them. By the late 1800s, Negroes began to disappear from professional baseball teams and were soon gone from them altogether. Now, there was never any written rule that prohibited Negroes from playing professional baseball. But soon after 1887, somehow Negroes all over couldn't get on a professional baseball team. Come to find out that all the white owners had gotten together in secret and decided to do away with Negroes in professional baseball. They agreed not to add any more to their teams and to let go of the ones they had. Called it a gentleman's agreement. And I'll tell you this, those gentlemen held to that agreement for almost 60 years. So, what were we Negroes left to do? We loved to play baseball, and a lot of guys had genuine talent. Sure, we could play against small semi-pro teams, which paid little, if at all, or swallow our pride and get a job working in some factory, but who wanted to do that? especially after tasting the fruits of what professional baseball had to offer. 
we had no choice but to start our own professional teams, our own leagues. And that's just what we did. In the early 1900s, there were many Negro baseball teams all over the Northeast and the South. Soon after the great migration of Negroes from the southern states to northern cities during the 20s, Negro baseball began to grow. Negroes tried several times to organize professional leagues, but they never lasted long because they didn't have the money or the leadership to stay in business. Then came Rube. Andrew Rube Foster was an old-time trick pitcher who'd come up from the Texas leagues. He was a preacher's son who called everybody darling. Like most ball players in his day, he bounced around from team to team before he landed in Chicago with the Leland Giants, who later became the Chicago American Giants, where he both played and managed. Back then, managers almost always played because the owners couldn't afford to pay a man to just sit in the dugout. Rube was a master, a brilliant man. He knew baseball like the back of his black hand, and more important, he knew how to win. He was a demanding manager and only wanted ball players who would follow his instructions. If a ball player didn't listen to Rube, he didn't last long. His players had to be able to bunt the ball into a hat consistently. All of them were fast, and if they got on base, it was over. They'd steal your shirt. Rube's game was built around speed and his own invention called the bunt and run. It was a simple play. They put a racehorse on first base and the batter would bunt the ball down the third base line. The runner would lead off the base with the pitch and be halfway around the bases by the time the ball hit the bat. The runner didn't stop at second and kept charging full speed toward third, which was left unguarded because the third baseman had to come in to pick up the ball. If the third baseman played behind the base, it was an automatic hit. If he came in, the runner slid safely into third. The play was just about impossible to defend against. It also worked if a man was on second, except the runner would run all the way home. They did this for nine innings. And let me tell you something. Those fellas would bunt and run you to death. Drove pitchers crazy. And the pitchers... They got their pitching instructions from Rube sitting in the dugout, not from the catcher, which was more common. He'd puff signals from his pipe or nod his head one way to signal a play. One puff, fastball. Two puffs, curveball. Things like that. They beat everybody that way. Rube's American Giants became the strongest Negro team in Chicago and the most famous independent team in the entire Midwest. Sometimes they even drew larger crowds than the local Major League Cubs and White Sox. Rube ran his ball club like it was a Major League team. Most Negro teams back then weren't very well organized, didn't always have enough equipment or even matching uniforms. Most times they went from game to game scattered among different cars, or sometimes they'd even have to hobo, which means hitch a ride on the back of someone's truck to get to the next town for a game. But not Rube's team. They were always well equipped with clean new uniforms, bats, and balls. They rode to the games in fancy Pullman cars Rube rented and hitched to the back of the train. It was something to see that group of Negroes stepping out of the train, dressed in suits and hats. They were big leaguers. It was after this success with the American Giants that Rube decided to organize an entire Negro baseball league. Rube aimed high. He wanted to create a league that would exhibit a professional level of play equal to or better than the majors, so that when it came time to integrate professional baseball, Negroes would be ready. See, Rube didn't want to put just one or two Negroes in the major leagues. He wanted to put a whole league into the major league. There would be the American League, the National League, and the Negro League. Rube knew that if Negroes were to play in a professional league, we'd have to organize it ourselves. We are the ship, he proudly declared. All else, the sea. On February 20th, 1920, 
Rube called together all of the owners of black baseball teams in the Midwest. They agreed to a set of rules that the league would follow. Rules that would stop player raids between teams and police the players' conduct on and off the field. They named the league the Negro National League. It had eight teams, the Cuban Stars, the Detroit Stars, the Chicago American Giants, the Chicago Giants, the Kansas City Monarchs, the St. Louis Stars, the Indianapolis ABCs, and the Dayton Marcos. Rube's League was home to great players, the likes of Oscar Charleston, Cyclone or Smokey Joe Williams, Ben Taylor, Cannonball Dick Redding, and John Henry Pop Lloyd. Rube took it upon himself to keep the league going. If a team wasn't doing well, he would help them out with a little cash. If there was a dispute between a player and an owner, he would help settle it. He gave black baseball dignity and set the standard for things to come. His league was so successful that a group of white owners of independent Negro teams formed a rival league of their own, the Eastern Colored League, just a few years after Rube started his. The pennant winners from each league met in a colored World Series at the end of the season. Second inning. A different brand of baseball. Negro League gameplay. We played tricky baseball. Cool Papa Bell, legendary Negro League outfielder. We had some white umpires from another league call our game once. Those poor fellas didn't know what to do with themselves. They made so many mistakes, they came over and apologized after the game, said they couldn't help it. They'd never seen our type of baseball. Said if they played like we did in the majors, they'd have to make the parks bigger to seat all the fans. We played a different brand of baseball from the majors. Negro baseball was fast, flashy, daring. Sometimes it was even funny, but always very exciting to watch. People would come early to the ballpark just to see us practice. We would whip that ball around the infield with such precision, they'd applaud. We took pride in our baseball, brought our own style to the game, and named our teams to match. Called ourselves the Baltimore Elite Giants, the Philadelphia Stars, the Birmingham Black Barons, the Cleveland Buckeyes, the New York Cubans, the Atlanta Black Crackers, and many more. And we could play like we invented the game. Kept the fans on the edge of their seats. Turned singles into doubles and doubles into triples just by running hard. We used Rube Foster's bunt and run game to perfection. They don't bunt much today. And it kills us. Some guys would clown on the field. Throw the ball behind their backs and get the guy out at first. Or play shadow ball where the infielders would whip an imaginary ball around the bases. If you didn't know any better, you'd have thought they had a real ball. That's how good they were. Lloyd Pepper Bassett used to catch some games in a rocking chair. Willis Jones used to take a newspaper with a hole in it out the center field and pretend he was reading it. If his team was way ahead and the ball was hit out there, he wouldn't go after it. One of the other guys would have to kill himself trying to get it. A lot of our guys didn't like all that comedy, because to us, baseball was serious business. It was our means of putting food on the table. But truth be told, some of that stuff was funny. There were a couple of guys, Reese Goose Tatum and Richard King Tut, who were with the Indianapolis Clowns. They had a routine where Goose played the dentist and Tut the patient. Tut would fill up his mouth with corn, and Goose would act like he was pulling on Tut's tooth, but it wasn't coming out. So Goose went and got a firecracker and lit it in Tut's mouth. As soon as it went off, Tut would jump up hollering and spitting out that corn like his teeth were falling out. Had people on their backs with laughter. They would do the same thing every night. Most of that clowning was done in the early days of Negro baseball, before Rube founded the league. The teams that clowned were not allowed in the league, 
because their acts were too much like the buffoonery you would see in the movies. Back then, the movies made full-grown Negroes look like fools or children, always telling jokes or dancing. Most of the time, it was white folks made up to look like Negroes. It was downright shameful. But still, people would come out to see Negro teams like the Indianapolis Clowns play. They were a good draw. They had some good players on that team, too. Did you know that the Major League home run champ, Hank Aaron, played with the Clowns before he went up to the Majors? We didn't really know how rough it was in the Negro Leagues until some of our guys went up to the Majors. Play was a lot nicer there. In our league, everything was legal. We would do whatever it took to win. Pitchers threw anything and everything. Spitters, shine balls, emery balls, cut balls, you name it. They cut that ball to pieces and had curve balls breaking about six feet. Throw a new white ball to the pitcher, and it would come back brown from all the tobacco juice and what have you. You never knew what the ball was going to do once it left the pitcher's hand. And throwing at a batter was common. The pitcher would knock you down just to mess with your head. Look up at the umpire, and he'd just say, Get up and play ball, son. That's why the batting helmet was invented. When Willie Wells was just a rookie, he found the ball was making its way toward his head a little more often than he liked, so he decided to wear an old miner's helmet when he stepped up to the plate. Boy, did they laugh at him. But today, you won't find a ball game played without batting helmets. Base runners would spike you in a minute. Some of those guys would spike their mother if she were blocking home plate. A catcher learned not to block the plate if a runner was coming home. Get in the runner's way, and he'd step on the catcher's foot or run him right over, knock all his gear clear off, come sliding in with his cleats high. Runners could tear your uniform off with those spikes. Some of those guys would sit in the dugout before the game, filing their spikes, look at you, and say, This is for you. Those guys were mean, and many of them loved to fight. Oscar Charleston was a mean son of a gun. He would just about go looking for trouble. One time, he snatched a hood off a Ku Klux Klansman. Judd Wilson loved to use his fists, too. Many close games ended with a fight. We didn't really have any spring training. We had to learn on the field. By springtime, we had already been playing down in Cuba or Mexico all winter. There wasn't any break. Soon as spring hit, we had paying customers. Games would last only about two hours and 15 minutes. Not like those long games they have today, which can go about three hours or more. None of that stepping in and out of the batter's box or stopping to have a word with the manager. We came to play. The ball we played with was a Wilson ball, which wasn't as lively as the expensive ball they used in the majors. Could you imagine all the home runs Josh Gibson or Norman Turkey Stearns would have hit if we'd had that kind of ball? And we bought our bat straight off the shelf. Major leaguers had theirs made. Umpiring wasn't always that great either. Some of those guys wouldn't have known a strike from their left foot. At one time, the league had official umpires, but they couldn't travel with the teams. It was too expensive. A few of the umpires were former players. Pop Lloyd and Wilbur Bullet Rogan used to ump later on in their careers. Those guys were tough. They had to be, with guys like Oscar Charleston and Judd Wilson in the league. At one game in Kansas City, there were three umpires. Rogan was behind home plate, and the other two were at first and third. A play took place at third base, and Rogan ran down the line. He called the man out and the base umpire called him safe. They started to argue and got into a fight. Bullet Rogan pulled out a knife, and the other guy panicked and took off running toward the center field fence and climbed over it. The next day, it was in the papers. Rogan had a bad temper. We wouldn't argue too much with him about balls and strikes. Whatever he called you, you would just let that go. He was old, but he'd fight you anyway. Some guys even played with a gun in their uniforms. It was a rough league. And stats. Well, some teams kept them, but it wasn't a consistent thing. 
most guys kept their own stats. Or if a player on the team was keeping them, a bit of the information was lost when he had to bat or play in the field. Occasionally, a local newspaper would send a reporter out to keep stats, but the papers wouldn't pay him to do it very often. Sometimes those guys would come late and have to ask around, what happened in the first inning? Who did what? Or they'd just make up the stats. Even when the stats were recorded, they weren't always phoned in, or it was too much to try to stop and find a mailbox on the road while we were headed for the next town. Shoot, the white papers wouldn't run our scores anyway. Stats weren't consistently kept until later, after Jackie Robinson went up to the majors. It was a rough life. Ride, 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 and ride. Hilton Smith, pitcher. We played in a rough league. We had a number of really unsavory characters like Charleston or Judd Wilson to contend with, as well as pitchers who didn't have a problem throwing at us. But that was something we had accepted as part of the game. I think what made our time a bit harder than most is what we had to deal with in addition to that. White fans would call us names and throw stuff at us on the field, and we couldn't say a word. In some places we traveled to, we couldn't get a glass of water to drink, even if we had the money to pay for it. And back then, water was free. We did an awful lot of traveling, mostly in buses. They were nice buses to begin with, but they weren't the kind that were made for riding every day. We ran those poor buses ragged. Many a time we'd ride all day and night and arrive just in time to play a game. Then we'd get back on that hot bus and travel to the next town for another game, often without being able to take a bath. I gotta say, that cramped bus would get pretty ripe on some of those summer nights after a double header. Phew! This was all season long. All of that traveling would wear on you. Many times the only sleep we got was on the bus. But that could be hard because we had to take the back roads to get to some of those little towns, and they were so bumpy, they'd have us bouncing around the bus like popcorn on a hot stove. Fast as we could go was about 35 to 40 miles an hour. If the driver got sleepy, a couple of the guys on the team would take turns driving the bus. To pass the time, we played cards or sang old Negro spirituals or barbershop numbers. Just about every team had a quartet. They'd be our entertainment for most of the way. Some guys could really sing. Most people don't know it, but Satchel Paige had a wonderful singing voice, and so did Buck Leonard. We would listen to them and try to join in. Traveling was even rougher down south. They didn't take too kindly to black folks down there, especially if you were from up north. We would have to travel several hundred miles without stopping because we couldn't find a place where we could eat along the way. It's a hurtful thing when you're starving and have a pocket full of money, but can't find a place to eat because they don't serve Negroes. And you could forget about trying to use the restroom in those places. You would just have to hold it or stop the bus and do your business in the woods. We had to get used to it. After a while, we learned which places we could stop at and which ones we couldn't. They didn't have any fast food places back then. Many times we wouldn't get food to eat before a game, and if we did, it usually wasn't much. We would have to play a doubleheader on only two hot dogs and a soda pop. If we couldn't buy food from a restaurant or a hot dog stand, we'd stop at a grocery store and get some sandwiches or sardines and crackers. Sometimes those grocery store clerks didn't want to serve us either. One time a store clerk told us to put our money in an ashtray if we wanted to buy something. He grabbed the money out of the ashtray and put the change back in it. He didn't want to touch our hands, but he sure did touch that money. I guess he had to draw the line somewhere. Just didn't make any sense. It was segregated in the north, too. They wouldn't serve us inside a restaurant, so we had to get our food from the back door and eat on the bus. We'd send one guy to buy food for the whole team. Hotels were segregated, too. Many times, we would get to a town after riding all day, only to spend a few more hours searching for a place to stay. The minute we arrived, inexplicably, every hotel would be full. If we couldn't find any place to stay, 
we would have to sleep on the bus. Some of the smaller clubs slept crammed in their cars or even in the ballpark because they couldn't afford to stay in a hotel. Some teams slept at the YMCA, the local jail, even in funeral homes. In cities, we stayed in Negro hotels or Negro rooming houses. We slept two, three guys to a bed. That's all the team owner could afford. A number of the Negro hotels were very clean and neat, but more than a few times we'd run into those places, and I won't call out any names, that had so many bed bugs you'd have to put a newspaper between the mattress and the sheets. And then in other places, we had to sleep with the lights on because the bed bugs would crawl all over you when the lights were out. Can't sleep with a bug on your leg. I don't care how tough you are. In small towns, we stay with local families. During the game, the manager would send someone to find people who would put us up for the night. By the time the game was over, we all had places to stay. Sometimes the colored church would fix us a meal, and I tell you, that was some good eating. If we got to a town and we had a little time to kill, we'd go fishing or catch a movie. Back then, a movie ticket only cost about 25 cents, and you could stay in the theater all day if you wanted to. We had to go through the back entrance, though, because they only allowed Negroes to sit in the balcony. There would usually be three levels in the theater, and the white audience would sit at the bottom. That whole middle section would be empty, as if the owners wanted us to be as far away from the white audience as possible. That kind of thing seems silly today, but that's how it was back then. We played about 80 to 120 games during the regular season. The major league teams played about 154. The rest of the time, we would barnstorm, which basically means that we played just about anybody and everybody who wanted to play a game, whenever and wherever we could get one. We barnstormed against professional and semi-pro teams all over the North, South, West, and the Midwest. Sometimes we played two, three, even four games in one day. For league games, we charged a dollar for the bleachers, two dollars for the grandstand, and two fifty for box seats. But in those little towns, the admission was just 50 or 75 cents and 25 cents for kids. We would average about 15 or 20 dollars per player per game. That wasn't bad money. In those days, you could do a lot more with a quarter than you can these days with a dollar. On some of those barnstorming trips, the smaller ball clubs slept on the side of the road in tents and had to catch their own food. The competition wasn't always very good in those little towns either, but we had to be careful not to run the score up so high that we wouldn't be invited back. On one occasion, Buck Leonard and his team couldn't play after they had traveled all day to get to this little town. When they got to the ballpark, they found out the Ku Klux Klan was marching there that night. They got back on the bus and blew out of there. I tell you what, back then, when the Klan was marching, Negroes went inside, turned out the lights, and pulled out a Bible. Barnstorming through the South was nice at times. When we played in small black towns, people always treated it like it was a special occasion. For them, it was a big deal when a Negro League team came to town. It was like a family reunion. They would barbecue and play music. We had a grand old time. After the game, We'd go eat some of that good food and hang out with those nice folks before we had to jump on the bus again. It was in those towns that we'd find a lot of new ball players too. They'd be playing, wearing some old heavy shoes and raggedy uniforms. But many of those kids could throw like the devil and hit the ball a country mile. If they looked good enough, we'd bring them along with us. Had to make sure it was okay with the folks first, of course. We would also find new recruits when we played Negro college teams. In fact, that's where we found many of our rookie ball players. A good number of the guys in our league were college educated. We played on some of the worst fields you could imagine. Once in a while, we'd play in a small town where they had just made the ball field the same day we got there. Some old pasture. You had to pray the ball would land in some cow stuff. Some were so patchy. Grass here, dirt there. 
Some didn't even have grass. And some were hard as a rock with pebbles all over the place. You were always worried about the ball taking bad hops. Can't get to be a great fielder in those conditions. A few of our big Negro teams had their own parks. But most teams rented the big league ballparks when the major league teams were away. Those big league teams made good money renting their parks to us. But don't you know that after paying them all of that money to play in their ballpark, we still had to suit up down the street at the local YMCA or someplace else because they didn't let us use the locker rooms. Makes you mad to hear players today squawk about jet lag and all of this. Try sleeping in a car with your knees to your chest, crammed with eight other guys, only to play a game the next day. Players today just don't know how bad it could be. We look back and wonder, how did we do all of that? It's simple. We love the game so much, we just look past everything else. We were ball players. There was nothing we would rather spend our time doing.